So in animation, I work as a painter. Um, sometimes my title is background painter, sometimes it's color stylist. So I color anything that you see that's colored. So sometimes it's the environment, and this is an example of the initial storyboard sketch, and then the cleaned up line work and then the final painting. And for this, I've been working in Photoshop. This was for a show called Tough Puppy at Nickelodeon. And um, when working in design and painting, it's always important to think about staging. Um, you want to think about where your character action is going to take place in the scene. Um, and so in the storyboard, it's a perfect reference point. In the left-hand corner over there, we have a view of the characters. They're waving goodbye to their friends who are going off on the, on the cruise ship. And then when I get the background, the characters are missing. The characters are going to be on a separate layer. But I still need to consider the lighting and the staging. I need to make sure nothing is visually interfering with the space where the characters are going to be. So I chose to light it and allow them to, to have their space there. This is another example from Tough Puppy. This is a, a cleaned up line drawing. And then the finished painting. This is from Fairly Out Parents. It's a little bit of a play on the Star Wars theme. So this is, I think, like the interior power source in the Death Star, maybe. I think we used a different term for it. But um, this actually is like classic Nickelodeon. This is from a show called Chalk Zone. And if you ever oh saw Chalk God. Zone, oh, there's some fans here. So, so in Chalk Zone, there's sort of the regular world and then the very imaginative chalk world. And so this was part of the chalk world. And, in that, in that piece, we had to use a lot of um, textures that felt chalky, so we created some special brushes. Um, initially, the show had been painted traditionally, and then as time went on and Nickelodeon was incorporating more technology, we shifted to digital. So this is a Photoshop painting, but we tried to make it feel kind of scribbly, and honestly, it was a lot of fun. It was, it's the sloppiest I've ever been able to paint on a show. So. Um, this is back to Tough Puppy again, and this one we really um, kind of tried to embrace a mid-century kind of clean design aesthetic. And you'll so you'll see a lot of just um, like geometric shapes, a lot of offset line work. That's Chalk Zone again. This was for a show called Wow Wow Websy. You might remember um, it was it was for for little kids I think mostly but hey it's cartoons they're for it. everybody right there for everybody <laughs> but whenever I talk to people with really little kids they say oh I know that show perfectly and they start singing the song so this we had um, Walden's art gallery and so we had all the characters um, kind of dressed up and inserted into famous pieces of art so I don't know does anyone recognize this so. yeah <laughs> so, We've, we're introducing some fine art into our animation. This is Fairly Out Parents again, this is the crowd scene. So that's an example of color styling in the crowd scene. And Kyle's, Kyle's excited, he's zooming through There's these. There's so much stuff, guys. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so with this one, um, we talked about teamwork before. So oftentimes the background painter is separate from the color stylist. So in this case, um, the background, which included the trees and the grass and the benches, that was painted by a background painter. And then my job as a color stylist was to paint the characters. So I had to make sure I used colors that would make those characters pop and separate from the environment. Um, on to the next slide. And then this um, is a title card. So this is the card at the very beginning of the show that shows you what episode we're watching. So this episode is the Fairly Odd Parents in Farm Pit. And these were oftentimes a fun opportunity to get a little more painterly, um, get to play with some gradients with the characters. Um, this is an example of space. This, space it is space. space. It's an example of space. It's the steps in the process. So when I'm working in Photoshop, I first do a, a initial color fill where it's just flat colors. Um, so this is my flat colors, and then the next slide is the texture. So I have a separate layer that's all my brushwork, and I like to keep my layers separated. It, at least initially, so when I'm working with my art director, if there are any notes, any changes that need to be made, if I have really clean separated layers, I can easily take a layer out or change the opacity, um, whatever the art director requires. And that's one reason I love digital, even though I, I started out as a traditional painter and I love mixing paint, but digital painting makes it so much easier for revisions. So, <laughs> so I'm a huge fan. This is Tough Puppy again. This is this. Oh, and back to that last one. Um, this is a great example of atmospheric perspective. So oftentimes um, when I'm painting, the line work I receive might just be consistent line work weights throughout the painting. And so it's my job as the painter to kind of try and create some dimension. 
And so here I wanted to show our Doom headquarters is the primary shot we're looking at. I, I think in this one there was going to be some animation happening out of the pipes. I think a character was going to pop out of the pipes. And the background area on the left, is just, it's just kind of for ambiance. It's just kind of to indicate what type of environment we're in. But nothing important is going to happen in that space in terms of, of animation. Um, and so I didn't want it to interfere with the character action. So I really went much more subtle with the colors and tried to drop it back in space. Um, so that's something to think about as well. Movie night for Wubsy. And then this is some of my student work. I always feel like it's important to remember where we've come from. And I, I didn't include like my most embarrassing student work. Kyle and I were actually going through some of our drawings from school the other day, and some of them were horrible. And he said, throw them away. You can do much better now. And I didn't throw them all away because I thought it's important to just recognize one's progress. And even when we're struggling in the moment, because even as professionals, sometimes we have tasks that we really struggle with, I think it's important to recognize how far we've come as artists and to look at every struggle as an opportunity for growth and for learning. So this is actually some of my student work that I'm a little more proud of. Um, this is a traditional painting I did in my very last year of undergrad. Um, and this was acrylics um, and cell vinyl on illustration board. Um, so we'll go to the next one. Um, this is also student work I did, and this is when I started getting a little more thoughtful about storytelling. So previously I was just working on my technique and trying to create environments, and then I realized, you know, something's really missing, because ultimately, in animation, the environment is there to support the character and support the story. And so I started creating my drawings with a lot more thought as to where the action was going to be and what the characters were going to be doing. This is also student work for me. Um, the palm or the uh, bamboo in the foreground is on a layer, a cell layer, so it's just a clear kind of plastic. So I mean, it's still the same concept in digital, where your characters are on a foreground layer usually if they're in the front, and you may have overlays like digitally. It would just be another layer in your digital file. But for me, this was actually a piece of plastic I had to lay over my painted environment. Um, this is a, a quick study I did, and this is actually while watching Harry Potter. So <laughs> I do this a lot at home, not to annoy people in the movie theater, but um, watching, I, I try to pick some of the movies where I really admire the direction or the design or the color sense, and then I'll just sit there in my living room with my laptop out or my sketchbook out, and I'll try and either replicate what I'm seeing or maybe just be inspired by it and create my own quick study piece. Um, and the next one, um, this was uh, after watching a movie as well, and it was not a movie about a surfing elephant, but it was a movie that involved a lot of water. I think it might have been Lilo and Stitch, or what, it was one of the sweet movies. If you probably just saw Moana, you could probably find a lot of water inspiration from that as well. But this was something I went home from the movie theater and went, I just want to paint water, and so I did this really quickly. So I mentioned before that I've, I've started expanding what it means for me to work as an artist, um, and I found some opportunities to reach out into the field of archaeology. And so I've been working on illustrations. It's really just been volunteer time when I have time off between projects. I decided instead of scrambling to get freelance or maybe just going on a vacation, which are also nice options as well, I thought I'm going to try and give back and, and use my art skills to maybe learn something new in a different field and also contribute. So I learned about an archaeological site that was in distress. Um, it, Sits, it's called Setemar Hoyek, and it sits on a coal reserve. And so there's a coal mining company that has purchased the land, and they're going to be mining the coal from the land. And so there's a university um, in America um, that had volunteered. It's University of New York at Buffalo. And they had partnered with a university in Turkey, which is Dumlupinar University, um, to try and rescue as many pieces from this archaeological site as possible before it's destroyed. And so I volunteered and I went with a group, an international group um, run by New York, the New York University. And I just went for the summer. And um, this is a little sketch I did of an artifact that was found. And it's a loom weight. So at this particular site in the early Bronze Age, which was quite a long time ago. <laughs> probably, probably this dates from maybe 2000, the year 2500 BCE. And so there was a lot of weaving that was happening, and this was a weight that was part of a loom. So um, one of the ways that we kind of learn about our, our human pro progress over time is to learn where we've come from. So much like keeping my student drawings and, and being proud of the progress that I've done personally, I think connecting to artifacts from 
our human past helps us to see as a group like how far we've come and we can oftentimes learn from the past because there's so much we've forgotten over time so much that's just been buried like this was literally buried and to stay um, on the theme of collaboration yeah. how many people are involved in just getting this into your hands so you can draw it yeah hundreds hundreds of people were involved in the process just educators and people working to gather the funding for this process actual excavators, people who are digging in the trenches, there's people who clean the pieces, there's people who restore the pieces, illustrators who are sketching. For those of you who are 3D artists, there's a whole group of 3D artists there who were taking photographs of the textures at the archaeological site and then building 3D models of the archaeological site and mapping those textures. And so when the site's destroyed, it won't really be destroyed forever, right? Because then we'll have a digital record of what the site looked like. So that's actually um, digital archaeology is is kind of an exciting field right now. So this is an image from the site. This was uh, one of my other uh, jobs was to create a reconstruction of this important building at the site. Um, and so I worked with Laura Harrison, who was at the time a PhD student interpreting the site, and um, and I created this illustration, and it's a cutaway illustration. So with this piece, you can see inside to the building, and there was a ceremonial hearth inside the building and this this particular building would have been kind of um, an executive and religious center of the village so this was you might say the most important site or the most central site um, and then the next slide is just the upper layer of, of the cutaway so this is Kyle's portfolio my portfolio it's I don't have cool archaeology, sorry guys. But you have cool, what, design and storyboards? Um, so, story yeah, time. so I started out as a designer and painter, um, much the way Kristen, what Kristen does now. Uh, these are a bunch of shots from El Tigre. It was at Nickelodeon. Um, that show was awesome. Um, some more stuff. So some stuff that we just, I designed, and then there's some stuff that we painted. Um, and the art department was amazing and collaborative, also because of the fact that we switched roles a lot. So sometimes design would switch over to paint, paint would switch over to design because people are so talented on that show that there was a lot of cross-disciplinary action that happened. Uh, this is a show from Nick Loden, Fanboy and Chum Chum. Um, I did a bunch of prop design for them. It was amazing because one day they'd say, hey, can you design us like a sweet ax and a giant hammer? And then the next day they'd be like, and we just need like a lawn chair. And then the next day they'd be like, hey, we need some like super gross teeth. Can you like do something really gross? And then a giant pipe organ. Like, what? Okay, guys, yeah, I'll do it. I love this. Uh, this is from a Disney show called The Buzz on Maggie. Most people have never seen that show, but it was an awesome show too. This was from uh, Mr. Men and Little Misses show that uh, Renegade did. And this was super cool because this was a style that I've never done before. So here's the other thing about animation. There's a lot of different styles to learn. Like, there's just so much ground to cover, and everything is different and unique and its own style. Um, so like, when Chris and I are walking around and we see different things, we're recording because everything has a different style to it. Like, uh, the ceiling's from a different era than this curve in the wall is, and it's just when you look around, everyone, I have different fashion sense than Kristen has. Like, it's just, everyone has a different style. And in animation, you really have the ability to that chameleon just take on these different styles. Here's a little bit of personal work when I was working on my portfolio to get, in, get, to get a job at the studios, just doing layouts of design and dinner renderings. <coughs> so this is a taco shop I made for a project for a friend. Um, here's some other work that I was doing for some smaller studios. So it's just like really creepy and moody in the style of um, the Warner Brothers Batman mm -hmm. show. Um, once again, just another cool style that I get to do. Same studio, different style again. So this is a bunch of painting and design. And just more just renderings and design styles. Uh, this is also from uh, Monsters vs. Aliens. And they're like, do a bunch of weapons. I'm like, yeah, I'll do a bunch of weapons. Weapons are awesome. But you know. Well, and something I know Kyle thinks about when he's designing particularly the machinery, like you're thinking about how all the cogs fit together, Definitely. like the actual engineering of it. And so that's something important too. I mean, you can you can kind of fudge with animation and if it looks like it works, it's good enough. But somebody like Kyle who like is really into it, I he mean, actually breaks down like how all of the like, pieces I work. had to design and paint this and it just had to be made out of pieces of other things. 
And so I had to figure out, because it's 3D, it has to be able to work. So I stuck a bicycle spoke into a hair dryer. That hair dryer goes into this box that actually spins this mechanism. And there's like a little gear here that pumps up and down as it's working. So there's a lot of like really cool things that you can like abstract your thought about and just <laughs> figure it out, figure out workings. The more cool prop and design. So a lot of it is. And it's is, for a 3D show. So you were show. making it look dimensional as yeah. reference for them. Yeah. And so the modeler would use this reference to build the model. Exactly. So again, that's a nice example of teamwork yeah, moving exactly. down the line. Yeah. And that's also why you had to think about how it worked. Because you were helping to make that person's job easier. Because if you gave oh, them something right. that didn't make sense, they'd have to like re-engineer it in their minds. So it's important to think about the next person who's down the line from you. Yeah, you don't want anyone to come back to you and say, I don't know what you did here. They want to be really obvious with it. So, and that um, shot that of the guy flying around in the forest, meeting little squeak, it all happened in this location. And I had to do all the, the color and styling of that. And here's a cabin that was there night and day. And just more environment shots. So you're just trying to create a mood. Okay, this is a storyboard from Robot Monster that was on Nickelodeon. And just all the different poses and little things you think about. Um, little acting moments, a little spider crawling off. Was that little spider in the script for you? It was or not in the script. Add I added him because I wanted just like a little moment of like creativity and happiness in there. And sometimes you can be really loose with the acting. Wow. And then other times you want to have a little bit of detail. Camera moves, big um, vertical pan on this character. Another vertical pan and diagonal up and then the camera falls him down. So as a board artist, you're boarding, you're directing, but you also think about composition, you're thinking about acting, you're thinking about setup, and also you want to deliver the lines, you want the actors to perform. So there's a lot of different things you have to worry about. And here's the camera turning on its axis, because it was a CG show, we could actually do that. And then we do lighting cues, sneaking in, flashlight. And the guy pops in, scares him off screen. <laughs> Camera pan over, and then truck out. So there's lots of little notational things that you can do to try to create your story. Down shots on characters. Lights come on. So hell shots on scary things, crazy three quarters. So this is from Powerpuff Girls. And so this is um, a lot of kind of roughed and comp stuff. So the way it happened in the actual episode was that we had a real book and it opened up and folded over. Um, but for the storyboard artists, we didn't have any real finalized stuff, so we just grabbed a book off a shelf and we did camera moves using Photoshop, um, counterclockwise truck in to the frame, we pan down, there's a little rabbit, sniff, 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 runs away, and then when she's running across, she leaves a slipper, fire! Stamp. And so this is what we do when we actually, once we do our boards, we pitch it to our crew. Um, and then we just thumb through. So here she comes into screen, stumbles, she falls down, she looks over, she's like, where are you? And then the dragon comes in, she starts running away. By the way, I make a lot of sounds on storyboarding, guys. It really helps. So she's like, help me! My knight! Cut to the ball, she's like, oh, could you use some help? And then off screen, we hear the dragon truck out. He comes up on over the edge, puts out some smoke. She's like, my dearest prince, I don't mean to be a bother, but now would be a good time to save me. And then he just, whoa! And then we pan down, and then a little fairy comes in, and you hear, magic, wow, twing. Results may vary. <laughs> and then we come back to it. And now we're in Townsville. Car drives off, there's people walking around. Guy comes in, checking his phone, and you hear the girls, buttercup, I'm not lying to you. And then we see the girls fly over. Clouds are made of water. And buttercup's like, Psh, yeah, right, if clouds are made of water, they'd be falling out of the sky all the time. And then the princess falls in her hands. And she's like, oh, clouds are pretty. 
And then Boston flies in. Wait a second, that's no cloud. And then we hear the dragon. We pan up. Dragon red hots. Right through the banner. And so then you just keep on going and you're boarding and you're in that moment. You're worrying about the shots, the composition. You want to tell these stories. And then Dragon coughs. He's sad. He wins. He runs away. And now it's a magical moment. So there's all these, like, you, and you take from things you've seen. So this episode um, is a lot to be owed to Disney, obviously. And we're kind of like having fun with it. Um, it's an homage. You want to like pay a lot of respect to it, but you also want to have fun with it. And that's our major goal when doing these things. And so in the very beginning of this board, I'm going to go all the way back. Okay, oops. I put weird title cards on the front of my things. By and there's the way. A, a romance novel yeah. cover. <laughs> Wait, you really want us to see that cover. We okay. Get it. <laughs> so, all these backgrounds I comped in because this is a specific feel I wanted, Evan Durrell, who was a big inspiration to me. And as and you. Who was Evan Durrell? Evan Durrell was a painter for all this, the Sleeping Beauty movie for um, Disney. Um, and recently had an exhibition at the Forest Lawn Cemetery in over here in Glendale. Which um, is a great resource if, if you guys haven't heard about it. Um, the cemetery has an art gallery with permanent and changing exhibitions. So that's a great resource right in Glendale if you want to pop over there sometime and, and kind of keep, I think they post on their website what's going on and they have big banners in front yeah. of the cemetery. But it's kind of an unlikely source to find inspiration and artwork, but it's there and also just sometimes we go, actually because we live close to there, we um, we go on walks and there's all these beautiful <laughs> sculptures and really interesting grave markers and they have um, reconstructions of, I think it's an Irish chapel there. And so, so it's a great place to take your sketchbook. There's all sorts of visual reference if you're looking, you know, to, to sketch statuary or even to people watch. Like there's yeah. lovely people just kind of, I don't know, babies in carriages being walked through the cemetery. Like, we love to take our sketchbooks to the zoo, sometimes to Disneyland, sometimes to the mall. Like, always be drawing. If you're an artist, always be drawing. Find opportunities for inspiration. Definitely. Um, so this is some stuff I did for Warner Brothers. Um, we also pitch shows. So this is one of the shows I tried pitching about a crazy family that lives at a, a fair in the middle of the city. Um, here's a weird comic we did for Comic-Con one year. Um, that we also tried to in the Cartoon Network. Um, Speed Racer, I don't know if you guys ever heard of Speed Racer. Yeah. yeah but um, yeah. we were approached to actually age it down. So this was something that never got into production, but we pitched it around. Um, Which is a good design. lesson in never giving up, yeah, right? Just, just gotta always keep on. put your ideas out there. Some of them stick, some of them don't, but you just keep it. creating. Always yeah. just keep creating. Don't keep them to yourself, share your ideas. Um, so this leads to our inspiration. Oh, right, inspiration. So, uh, Friedrich Bach, who was a Canadian uh, back in the 80s, this is what inspired me to get into animation. Um, it's called The Man Who Planted Trees, and it was done all by hand on paper using colored pencils and pastels. Um, and I don't know, like even when I look at it now, I get a little choked up because it's just, it's such a, a work of love and it's a tour de force of just effort and time and just seeing the vision through. Um, yeah, I, I could watch this all day, but I'm not going to make you guys do it. <laughs> um, also, I'm a big fan of Cowboy Bebop. Yes. Um, so, hopefully this isn't uh, too violent for you guys. But it's just such a contrast of where you can get your inspirations from. Like, yeah, I love the man who planted trees, but this scene is also... It's just freaking amazing. Like, how do how do they work the camera the way they work it? How do they get the acting? The active camera, Look the, at the lighting subtle pans, well. um, like one frame flashes. It's just it's just good filmmaking. Never mind like the limited animation. You don't have to have a full animation of a man and plant trees. You could also be limited and drift characters across the screen to tell the same story. You can hold a shot and with the subtle pan, um, like a blur. All you need is one flat frame of blur and it seems like motion is happening. And then just silhouettes, how important are silhouettes? So there's so many things that are happening 
that you process, and it can be overwhelming. Don't get overwhelmed by these kinds of things. Like these things, you learn, you start using. Um, there's almost too much happening in this scene. You don't have to do this much to get that kind of story across. Um, and of course, uh, some classic Looney Tunes. Like this is, this is all I consumed, like every weekend. Um, yeah, I think we we both grew yeah, up on Looney Tunes. Completely. Yeah. And I wish they showed more of it because just. You can't watch it and not smile. Like seriously, look at this. Like look at the character shape. We love to play with different shapes. And this, which. And physics don't make sense. Look at that, Who bobby cares? pins everywhere. Like to think about how you build a character's personality, like that's a beautiful moment. Those bobby pins hanging yeah. in the air after she. And the spaces you know, don't make sense. Look how she walks. Think about how you make your characters walk. Like something as, as subtle as the walk can give your character such personality. So is um, this Evelyn Earl here? So this is Evelyn Earl. So you can see how um, it connects back to the But that's the part of like, you have to be out and experience things. Like, if there's a museum thing happening, go see it. If there's a billboard falling off, um, you know, in the city, look at the textures. There's, there's- Look at the shapes of these trees. I love that they're all kind of squares and rectangles. Like, it's okay to push outside of natural shapes. I think that's, that's something you're allowed to do in animation yeah. that sometimes in other fields you're not encouraged to do. You just be expressive. And so we love it. We love just to play with shapes. Geometry and color. This is Evelyn Earl's stuff. Um, so there's some Maurice Noble from the Looney Tunes stuff. I mean, what wood looks like that? But you know it's wood and it looks great. Uh, this is from Emperor's Groove. Emperor's New Groove. Yeah, Emperor's Groove. This is from Tangled. So that's, that's kind of development work. That's right. the studies that happen before you really get into um, the This production. is Scott Willis from Samurai Jack. But also, this is Scott Willis from uh, Down the Drain. Mm -hmm. And this is Scott Willis from uh, Symbiotic Titan that was on Cartoon Network. So he's really pushing so look at, look at diverse that range. styles. Yeah. And this, oh, I can't remember this guy's name, I'm sorry. Avi Nedklu, I believe. But look at the expression, it's like, love them. And what we love to do, actually, is we love to see the student work that comes out every year. We kind of hop online and see what they're putting out, just to see. Like, what are the new ideas coming out? Because, I mean, we're, we're I don't know, would you say like middle-aged animators at this point? We're not young sure. anymore. So, young I enough. mean, it's important to constantly, in a field that's changing and, and latching onto new technology as quickly as animation does, um, we know that the basic skills translate through every type of tool you're using, but we need to be familiar with what the tools are and what the style shifts are. So animation is an industry where I think we both feel like we need to always be learning. So we're always reaching out and finding out what's new and, and even in, in color, like the color trends shift. Like I love to watch commercials on TV and... Yeah, just never stop learning. I guess that's the... Packaging is an Collaboration. Yeah. Uh, look at, look around you and never stop learning. And then we have, I think... Oh, there's one more. A couple more. Or is that it? No, no thank, thank you! you. <laughs> thank you for having us.